Our topic this week is thinking about mezzanine and scale issues um, sort of from on the ground nuts and bolts perspective, but also this class has been combined with uh, our topic on growth from a more big picture uh, perspective. And so you guys are uh, great because you bring sort of both this on the ground uh, perspective based on the nature of your work, but also are deeply engaged in sort of the sector at large and can speak to broader issues. So uh, John McIntosh is uh, a partner at Sea Change Capital Partners, and the first of two guests we'll have from that firm this semester. Um, its firm is capturing a lot of attention in the field because it's a new model, intermediary, uh, based on sort of an investment bank model to help organizations scale and grow. Um, and so uh, we'll talk to with him about sort of the thinking behind the model as it's developed and what they look for when they're thinking about taking on new clients. Uh, Mike O'Brien. Uh, is the CEO of iMentor, which is um, now in the midst of a growth phase. Uh, as we've discussed, most of our perspective uh, and discussion over the course of this semester is focused on pure nonprofit capital market and not paying much attention to revenue generating um, strategies. But iMentor combines both sort of a philanthropic model for its direct programming, but also now a revenue generating strategy that. Um, interacts with the direct service. So it's interesting to get that perspective and, and uh, what he's finding at the early stage of uh, his growth campaign. Iris Chen is um, now the CEO of I Have a Dream Foundation, which is a national organization and will be able to talk to us about the challenges of uh, managing an organization with multiple affiliates around the country, um, but also comes to that role from her position as the executive director of Teach for America in New York, and she led that through a very high uh, growth period and so again uh, sort of and sort of been around uh, these circles for a bit an original Teach for America person so uh -oh. sort of deeply versed in um, <laughs> uh, social entrepreneurship and also sort of the challenges of on the ground uh, and Danielle and, uh, say your last name Scatoro. Uh, okay Scatoro, <laughs> um is at Edna McConnell Clark Foundation which also gets quite a bit of attention um, in philanthropic circles both because they went through their own process of becoming much more focused in their own strategy of supporting high growth youth development organizations, and also more recently because um, they have been a leader in um, syndication, essentially bringing together other funders um, who can support members of their portfolio in sort of further growth even beyond where Edna McConnell Clark has taken them, and Danielle's been working on that closely. So issues of the capital market of um, syndication and exit strategy and growth is sort of all bound up in, in her work. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you guys and you know you can uh, both share sort of your personal path because that's always interesting for folks to hear how you got where you are and then also if you want to uh, give a snapshot of sort of the organizational perspective that uh, so your what your organization does beyond what I've said and um, and how that shapes your thinking around growth generally, and then we'll get into sort of more topics uh, in the area. Uh, hi, I'm John. And uh, I guess through mid-2006, I was fully in the, in the for-profit world. I was a partner at one of the larger global private equity firms called Warburg Pincus, um, basically searching the, the world, in a way, for um, entrepreneurial-led organizations that we could invest in, and if they were successful, by and large, in, in growing, um, certainly in growing their income, which usually meant growing their revenue as well, we would um, make money for ourselves, for our limited partners, and for the entrepreneur. Uh, and I had the, I guess, the pleasure of doing that both in New York, and then in Tokyo, and then in London, um, but ultimately got a little bit dissatisfied because at, at this sort of level of generalities, finding great entrepreneurs, bringing them not only money, but an outside perspective, helping them achieve their dreams, that all sounds good. Um, you know, but increasingly, I was less than, than moved by what their dreams actually were, which was sometimes you know, to put a fourth stripe in the toothpaste. Um, <laughs> and I mean, you know, that's fine. Um, so I studied philosophy for a year, uh, and thought I'd come back uh, and go back into finance, just take a breather, <coughs> and got tricked <coughs> into um, what was supposed to be an hour a week uh, but ended up being three days a week project, um, basically taking an intervention 
that had been tested and been pr proven, we'll talk about what proven means, um, to build resilience in middle school children here in, in the United States at Penn, um, but really tested as a science project, a very expensive piece of academic work, um, taking it to the UK and doing it in real scale. So I spent the better part of a year writing grant requests, haggling with evaluators about whether quasi-randomized controls were quite good enough and, and enjoyed it so much um, that when I came back, I thought if I could find something that was sort of private equity-like, entrepreneurial sort of focused in and around children, which is my passion, um, with people who I liked, I would do that. I expected I wouldn't find that job. Um, but I met Chuck Harris, who you'll meet later this year, just after he had set up Sea Change. And two seconds on Sea Change. This isn't an advertisement. You're not our target customer. Is um, there's something like 35,000 less now um, people with 50 million dollars plus of liquid net worth in this country. <laughs> and there are a million and a half nonprofits. Um, and many of these people don't have any philanthropic impulse, and a small number of the ones, all of whom's names you know, Dale, Buffett, Soros, are well supported in their philanthropy. They have the means and the will to set up foundations with professional staff to help them, but most of the others don't. Um, and our argument is um, that at least one useful thing to do would be to try to, to be an intermediary between some self-selected group of those people and some great nonprofits. And to make our life easier, um, we're focused on people, only on people who say, as part of my philanthropy, I'm interested in doing um, big ticket giving to uh, institutions serving youth and children in the United States, social justice, national competitiveness, da 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 da. And we figure if we can get a couple of hundred of those people into a network where we can develop some relationship of trust, then if we can go into this world and find a relatively small number of organizations that are doing good work and need capital to grow, we can help the money flow. But unlike Robin Hood and others who are doing great work, this isn't a fund. So we think that, that philanthropy is so value laden that, that what we should do is we should run out, run out there and tee up by doing real due diligence, developing personal conviction, putting our own money in, um, tee up the opportunity while leaving these donors with absolute, complete, and utter discretion as to what they back, if anything. I think the closest thing to us would be the Democracy Alliance in terms of doing the same thing but around progressive political agenda. Um, and I guess the last thing I'd say is we are looking for organizations that want to grow, but as we'll probably get to, not because I think most organizations should grow or even can grow, but just because that's where we think we can add value. Okay? Because most of these nonprofits have, at best, a through the glass, darkly, totally non systematic connection into the world of the wealthy, um, which is really a bad thing <coughs> if they're trying to raise real money because they're desperate to take a meeting with anybody who breathes and has dough. These people feel overly solicited. We feel we can sort of be a matchmaker. Um, the one thing I would say, which is sort of different <coughs> than that, we are not a fundraising agent for nonprofits. It's true that if we do what we hope we can do, a happy side effect will be that great nonprofits raise capital more efficiently, and that's where our heart is. But we think the best way to do that is by unambiguously being a fiduciary for donors. So we're telling donors, we've done real work and we think I have a dream's great, and I'm putting my own money in, and we're showing it to you, but we're not showing it to you because we've been hired by I have a dream. We're showing it to you because we think it's really good for you. And so a lot of the things we think about is, you know, what kind of information can you flow to your donors because we have an obligation to them while still not getting the nonprofit world too antsy. We have about 100 donors now, and we hope to, to do our first funding um, very early next year, and we'll see how it goes from there.